This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of violence or criminal activity in any way. Welcome to the sleepy little town of Skidmore, Missouri, which is known for only one thing, and that's murder. Ken Rex McElroy was murdered on July 10th of 1981 in one of the most bizarre cases you will ever hear about. And it should have been an open and shut case. There were over 40 witnesses. The shooting occurred in broad daylight on Main Street. But in the end, the residents of Skidmore, Missouri weren't so eager to talk about what had happened and no one came forward. It sounds like the end to the movie Roadhouse, but this ain't no movie. It was an entire town engaging in vigilante justice on a man who terrorized them for years. And 40 years later, police still don't know who ended McElroy's life. So how did an entire community, sick of being let down by the justice system, take the law into their own hands and get away with it? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the life of Ken Rex McElroy and the town that killed him. Described as the town bully and a monster, Ken Rex was alleged to have stolen, assaulted, burned a house, and attempted to murder more than one person in that town. We're going to talk about his wives. We're going to talk about the major incidents and the attempted murders that the justice system just wasn't addressing. Then we're going to talk about the townspeople and what they did to solve the problem that the government couldn't. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button. And you guys know it, I love it when you share my videos on social media. Lawyer Up is proud to partner with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy or sell stocks or crypto or whatever you're into directly from your computer or the mobile app on your phone. Weeble is free to join, it's free to use, it's no cost, no commission, free trading. Better yet, when you sign up, link a bank account, and deposit as little as one cent, Weeble will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 a piece. So it's free money as well. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Weeble traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below this video to sign up. Happy trading. Ken Rex McElroy was born on June 1st of 1934, the 15th of 16 children born to a poor migrant tenant farming couple named Tony and Mabel McElroy. Ultimately, the family would settle outside of Skidmore, Missouri, in the extreme northwest portion of the state. Now, Skidmore, located in Nottoway County, is a tiny little town that at no point over the last 40 years has had more than 800 people or so living there. Everything in the town is basically on one little street, and back in the 70s and 80s, that included a bank, a gas station, a grocery store, and of course, a bar, the D&G. But more on that later. Ken Rex dropped out of school in the eighth grade and quickly established a local reputation as a small time thief. But as he grew up, he moved from misdemeanors to felonies. He was called, quote, bad dog, a monster, and of course, the town bully. Standing six foot three inches, 240 pounds, with jet black hair, long chops, and steely blue eyes, he was a menacing sight to the people of Skidmore. In fact, over the next two decades, McElroy would be suspected of being involved in the theft of livestock, grain, gasoline, and of other property, and of arson, assault, and of attempted murder, just to name a few. 
In total, he would be charged some 21 times, but he avoided conviction after conviction by engaging in a pattern of witness intimidation, causing witnesses to refuse to testify after he would stalk his targets repeatedly parking outside their homes or their businesses, or would otherwise just outright threaten them to their faces. Ken Rex even once told a cop that he, quote, aimed to kill any man that sought to put him in the pen. So not only were witnesses afraid of him, townsfolks would say that the cops, the prosecutors, and the judges wanted no part of his wrath either. And he was a womanizer, fathering more than 10 children with several different women. He met his last wife, Trina McLeod, when she was 12 years old. He would pursue her relentlessly, even stopping her school bus and removing her on occasion. And despite being 23 years younger, by age 14, Trina became pregnant, dropped out of school, and went to live with McElroy. And his wife, Alice. Yeah, he was already married. And unfortunately, Alice, who was abused herself, was in no position to do much about it. So it's 1972, and the talk within law enforcement was to charge McElroy with engaging in intercourse with a minor, what we call statutory today. In response, McElroy's lawyer proposed that he divorce Alice, marry Trina, which would allow him to assert the marital privilege which at that time would prevent her from testifying against him. McElroy, of course, had the Fifth Amendment right not to testify against himself, so with both of those two being the only witnesses to the offense, charges would have to be dismissed. Now, neither Trina nor Alice were a big fan of this idea, so in 1973, 16 days after Trina gave birth, both she and Alice fled Kenrex to Trina's mother's house. According to court records, McElroy would track them down, drug them out of the house by their hair, and took them home. He then returned to Trina's parents' home, shot the family dog, and burned the place to the ground. And after these antics, McElroy was indicted in June of 1973 for arson, assault, and statutory Meanwhile, Trina and her baby were placed in foster care at a home in Maryville, Missouri, which was about 15 miles away. And although Ken Rex was arrested, he was soon released on bail. In short order, McElroy tracked Trina down and would just sit outside of the foster home for hours at a time, staring at it. And on one occasion, he told the foster family that he knew where their daughter went to school and what bus route she rode, and he would trade, quote, girl for girl to get his child back in what was obviously a thinly veiled threat to kidnap their daughter. But ultimately, Trina would recant her story of abuse. Her parents relented and agreed to the marriage. And in 1974, McElroy divorced Alice and married Trina in order to escape charges of statutory and he got off scot-free. And despite now technically being divorced from Alice, they would all continue to live together and he would father additional children with both of them. And you would think after dodging a legal bullet like that, Kenrex would calm down for a bit, but he didn't. On July 27th of 1976, Skidmore farmer Romaine Henry heard gunshots on his property and went to investigate. As he tells it, he drove up upon a vehicle and immediately noticed it was Ken Rex. He said that McElroy approached his truck and accused him of being over at his place in a white Pontiac. Henry responded that he wasn't and didn't even own a car like that, to which McElroy called him a liar, raised a shotgun and pulled the trigger firing through the passenger side door of the truck. Henry's flesh would be torn from his stomach, and there was so much buckshot embedded in him, they weren't able to extract it all from his body at the hospital. Fortunately, Henry would live, and McElroy would be charged with assault with intent to kill. From the beginning, McElroy would deny ever even being at the scene. And as the case drug on, Henry would state that McElroy would park outside his home and did so on at least a hundred occasions, often firing a gun into the air in an effort to intimidate him. 
Finally, the day of trial came around and two raccoon hunters would testify for the defense and state that they were with McElroy on the date of the shooting and away from Henry's property. Then after Henry admitted on cross-examination that he had lied about his own prior criminal history, McElroy was acquitted. He got away with it. Unbelievable. The next major incident would occur in 1980 at the little grocery store in Skidmore owned by 70-year-old Ernest Bo Bowenkamp and his wife Lois. Well, on that day, two girls, one aged 14 and one aged 4, were looking around the store when the little one picked up three pieces of two-cent gum and put it in her pocket. Witnessed by a store employee, she immediately confronted the little girl and made her put the candy back. This was obviously upsetting to the child, and when she got home, she told her parents about it. Little did the Bowen camps know these girls were McElroy. Well, after a verbal altercation at the store, Ken Rex began stalking the Bowen camp family. And eventually, on April 25th of 1980, he caught Bo alone on the little loading dock at the back of his store. As Bo tells the story, Ken Rex approached him and asked him if he wanted to fight. After Bo said he had no reason to fight, Ken raised a rifle and shot Bo and Camp in the neck. Staff from the store would run out onto the loading dock to see Bo lying in a pool of blood, covering his neck, and all he could say was McElroy. So Ken Rex is picked up later that night and jailed, but he would post bond and be out by morning. And by the very next day, he would be back in town bragging about shooting Bo. Again, as with Romaine Henry, Bowen Camp miraculously survived the incident. But even after his release from the hospital, Ken Rex continued to stalk the Bowen Camp family parking outside of their home and their business, and firing shots into the air. The Bowen camp said that they would call the police, but they didn't do anything. Hell, even the cops were afraid of Ken Rex. But even though they were terrified, the Bowen camp stood their ground. Ken Rex was charged with first-degree assault with a deadly weapon, faced a sentence of 10 to life, and about a year later, the case would go to trial. And guess what? Ken Rex was convicted. Finally, the people of Skidmore would get the justice that they longed for. Or would they? Much to the chagrin of the people of Skidmore, McElroy filed an appeal of the decision and asked to be freed on bail pending the outcome. On the day of the hearing, the courtroom in Maryville, the county seat, was full of Skidmore residents, many of whom having signed affidavits protesting Ken Rex's release. Nonetheless, after argument from the attorneys, the judge agreed to free Ken Rex pending the outcome of the appeal. This, of course, enraged the town. And to make matters worse, by the time the residents got back home, about a 15-mile drive, Ken Rex was already there. Apparently, after being released by the court, McElroy went straight to D&G Tavern, Skidmore's tiny little bar that looked more like a storage shed than a business. Inside, armed with an M1 army rifle with a bayonet attached, Ken Rex was making graphic threats about what he was going to do to Bowen Camp the next time that he saw him. And this was really the straw that broke the camel's back for the citizens of Skidmore, and it solidified their realization that the legal system was not going to provide them justice. He was just found guilty, but yet he was walking around like a free man. So several townspeople met with the sheriff, Danny Estes, to see what they could legally do to prevent McElroy from harming anyone else and the sheriff suggested they form a neighborhood watch. Not real helpful. However, in the days that followed, there was a glimmer of hope. Some of Ken Rex's antics had caused the state to file a motion to revoke his bond, and it was set for hearing on July 10th of 1981. But as is often the case, the hearing was continued by the attorneys. Enraged, the townspeople met at the Legion Hall in the center of town. Estimates put those in attendance at over 60 individuals, including Sheriff Estes. It was described as a hotly contested meeting with rumors of money changing hands over the death 
of McElroy. This prompted the sheriff to instruct the group not to get into a direct confrontation with Ken Rex McElroy. The sheriff then left the Legion Hall and headed back to Maryville where his office was located. As he rolled out of town, Ken Rex rolled in. Trina at his side and they headed for the DNG. As they sat drinking at the bar, word got back to the men at the Legion Hall that he was in town. This got an already riled up crowd eager for action. And the townsfolk, well, they headed to the bar. As Trina would later recount, the bar suddenly filled up with people, which was rare because the bar was usually empty, and she said they were giving out free beer, which never happened. She recounted that the crowd was openly hostile, jeering Ken Rex and making her feel uncomfortable. Accounts were that McElroy would quickly finish his drink, purchase a six pack of beer, exit the bar and enter his pickup truck. The townsfolk, they would follow him out and they encircled his truck. Trina would later recall that she saw a man walk over to his vehicle, retrieve a gun and then walk back. McElroy started the engine, sparked up a cigarette, and then shots rang out. Trina screams, not knowing what was happening. Then she pisses her pants as McElroy slumps over the steering wheel. His body fell forward with his foot pressing down on the accelerator. In the chaos, the engine would run full throttle with a deafening roar as onlookers scrambled to pick up shell casings and they would do a really good job because the police would find no shell casings anywhere at the scene, none. One person recounted that he picked up shell casings in an area littered with Ken Rex's teeth. Eventually, the engine started smoking and blew, and then there was silence. Nothing but the smell of burnt oil, smoke, and blood in the air. Ken Rex was dead. Hit twice, once in the head and once in the neck, by two different rifles, and a third style bullet would later be drug out of the truck body, evidencing there were at least three shooters. And as McElroy lay there bleeding out, not one soul bothered to call an ambulance. Trina was escorted out of the vehicle and up to the town bank, and as Cheryl Bowenkamp would recount, someone opened the door of the grocery store and said, quote, it's over. You can sleep tonight, now just stand behind us. From there, the townspeople would scatter. Rumor is that the guns were scooped up, taken to a blue van at the edge of town, and driven to Cheyenne, Wyoming to be disposed of. And there was one gun that didn't make the trip that had been missed that was ultimately thrown into the Nottoway River. In all, there were 46 potential witnesses to the shooting, including Trina McElroy. In the end, only Trina claimed to identify a gunman every other witness would either not name an assailant or claim to not have seen who fired the fatal shots. The investigation would later reveal that McElroy was shot through the driver's side window at close range and from the back, but no weapons and no shell casings, so there were no ballistics that could be performed. After the local prosecutor declined to file charges and a grand and coroner's jury failed to return an indictment, an extensive federal investigation commenced where over 100 interviews were conducted. But again, no one claimed to know who did it and the investigation did not lead to any charges. And when you think about it, who had a motive to kill Ken Rex? Well, everybody. Who would benefit from the death of Ken Rex? Again, everybody. And who that was there that day owned a rifle? Everybody. As one local resident later told investigators when asked what happened, he responded, he needed a killing. In the end, Ken Rex McElroy was buried at Memorial Park Cemetery in St. Joseph's, Missouri. Trina McElroy would file a $5 million wrongful death lawsuit against the town of Skidmore, the mayor, the county sheriff, and Del Clement, who was the individual that Trina accused of being the shooter, but who was never charged. The case was later settled out of court by all of the parties for $17,600 with no one admitting guilt. Trina would remarry and move to Lebanon, Missouri, where she died of cancer in 2012. At the time, this story captured the attention of journalists and true crime buffs from all over the world. 
It was covered by all of the major national news networks, including town visits from Morley Safer, Tom Brokaw, and Maury Povich. It was made into a book and subsequent movie entitled In Broad Daylight, starring Brian Dennehy, and the staying power of these events is evidenced by No One Saw a Thing, a 2019 television documentary miniseries on Sundance TV made almost 40 years later. And I'll leave you with this. Even though technically this town got away with murder, there are those residents who say that they did not escape a curse. Once a growing small town, after the McElroy murder, the town has seen the gas station, convenience store, and bar go out. They've seen the population dwindle to less than 300 people and a string of nine, count them, nine mysterious deaths since 1981. Just a super creepy number of tragic events for a town with a population that is now under 300 people. Are they cursed? Well, that's for you to decide. So that's the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a comment, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button for me. And you guys know it. I love it when you share my videos on social media. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching A Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.